Good morning, Family of Faith Church. Uh, it's nice to be with you this morning. Um, I'm actually with you virtually this morning. I am in Monroe, in my own church, uh, preaching. Our service starts at 10 o'clock, but due to the miracle of technology, I am also with you today at your 1030 service. Um, and so uh, it's nice to be with you. I wish I could be there live. Um, and maybe in 2021, uh, your pastor and I can coordinate our vacation time and maybe I'll be able to preach at your church live next year, this year, 2021. Last year, 2020 was kind of a weird year. Um, according to a, a public opinion poll done by the American Psychiatric Association in October, okay, so just before the election, um, they asked Americans if they were more anxious now in 2020 than they were in 2019. And about two-thirds of us, 62% of Americans, said that, yes, we are more anxious now than we were a year ago. Um, they asked people, you know, what are you worried about? And uh, what made them extremely or somewhat anxious? And these were some of the top answers. Number one was safety, keeping themselves and their family safe. Number two is just COVID-19. Um, their health, so those are all kind of related. Uh, I guess, in a sense, so is gun violence. That was on near the top of the list. And of course, the presidential election made people very anxious, worried about today, worried about tomorrow. Anxiety and worry and fear are not new to 2020 or 2021, to the modern era. People have always been anxious about life and afraid of the things that might harm them or their loved ones. Um, worried about tomorrow, worried about today. When I was a kid, um, mostly my brother bought these magazines, but I read them. Um, but the Mad Magazine was our source of inspiration and news for kids like us with a weird sense of humor. And sort of their byline was, what me? Worry? The truth is that the world gives us a lot to worry about, a lot to be anxious about. Here's a video clip uh, of people answering the question, what makes you anxious? Yeah, when people rush me, it's kind of annoying. Going to a concert? When I have a test at school. Being left alone without a family member. Schoolwork. Test. Thinking about when I'm an adult and I have to pay for things. Lockdowns at school. The fear of not succeeding. Not being perfect. Being seen by anybody gives me anxiety. This right now causes me anxiety. Not being able to get to my train on time. Other people. Um, sometimes social situations where I don't know people causes me anxiety. Student debt. Procrastination. My goals. Not hearing from someone when I'm expecting to hear back. I guess losing someone. The unknown. Where you have to talk to someone and maybe that person's grumpy and... Uh, public speaking. When I see my loved ones going through tough times, that causes me anxiety. Social medias. To know that my parents are not doing well. I saw arguments. Flying. Paying my bills. If someone that I care about is going through something and they don't communicate to me what it is that they're going through. Not knowing. Deadlines. Knowing that I didn't do my best. You know, being unemployed. My two sons that, you know, they're going to be happy and content. My mother's health. Being questioned in front of a camera. My wife. <laughs> this guy. So worry and anxiety and fear. I know that those terms are all distinct. Worry, anxiety, fear. But I want to kind of lump them together and just say that those are normal human emotions. That we can say what me worry, but in fact, there is something in us that worries. They actually had a hundred different people answer that question um, on that video. I just showed you some of them. And there was one person out of a hundred who said, I don't have anxiety. And he seemed kind of anxious while he was saying it. So I'm not sure he was telling the truth. A definition of worry, if you look it up, is worry is an ongoing state of anxiety. And then if you look up anxiety, it says it's a state of worry. So I'm just kind of worried about the definition of anxiety and worry. But you know what it is. It's this feeling of unease and apprehension and deep concern. And anxiety can make people physically sick. So a lot of people 
don't like to speak in public. They're very anxious about it and it can make them physically sick. Like they can be nauseous, their hands can shake, they breathe rapidly, they sweat. I mean, we've actually all experienced that uh, probably. Anxiety attacks happen to people where um, the anxiety just gets so overwhelming that it can be paralyzing and people, and this perhaps has happened to you, where you just can't even function at that moment. In Matthew 6, Jesus talks about worry and he says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Now some of you may be tempted to say, well that's easy for you to say, you're Jesus after all. Maybe you're not looking forward to somebody telling you that you shouldn't feel the way that you feel. You feel anxiety and you don't want somebody to just stand up here and tell you, well, don't feel that way. Well, it helps, I think, to look at these words in context. It'll help us to understand what Jesus is teaching and why it's important and maybe how it might help us as we begin a new year. So we are, um, this passage is in the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is at the beginning of Jesus' ministries. It's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in many ways, it captures the heart of Jesus' teaching ministry, what his teaching was all about. So we're just going to back up a little bit in chapter 6 um, to just kind of read that one verse in context. We'll start at verse 19. Matthew 6, 19 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. I see that little phrase there as an illustration that Jesus is using the, the, where he's warning us about the focus of our life. So is the focus of our life, the focus of our eyes on earthly things or on heavenly treasures? Um, so then he goes on to say, if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So this is about serving the right master, about the right cause. It's about treasures, about how you invest your life. What is the focus of your life's ambitions? You're either focusing your life on God and the things of heaven, or you're focusing your life on yourself and the things of earth. And Jesus' teaching here is that we should store up in our lives, treasures in heaven, not on earth. So based on that teaching, Jesus says in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. And yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Well, Jesus is contrasting two ways of living, either focusing on yourself and your earthly concerns like food and clothing or focusing on the kingdom of God. And part of that teaching is that selfishness, when we just focus on ourselves and our needs, wants, and desires, actually increases anxiety and worry in our lives. And Jesus is calling us here to take our eyes off of our worldly concerns and to focus on storing up treasures in heaven. And he does that by asking us to consider the birds and the flowers. If I tell you, 
I don't have any worries. I just don't worry. I don't worry about food or clothes or tomorrow. You might think that then I don't make any effort to feed myself or clothe myself or get properly dressed. But look at the birds. Jesus' illustration. Birds aren't lazy. They work for their food. They build nests. They, but they don't worry. They're not anxious. They don't have a retirement fund. They don't even have savings. I mean, this isn't a matter of work and effort, but of needless anxiety over things that we can't control anyway. And if God cares for the little birds, then how much more will he care for his own children who are made in his own image? The topic of worrying comes after this declaration about serving the right or the wrong God. Because if you serve the wrong God, little gods, your life is going to be full of worry because there's a lot to worry about. If your God is the American economy, if your God is yourself, if your God is some trinket that you keep in your pocket and get out to pray to, then you should worry. You have a lot to worry about. So you listen to our culture and we talk a lot about the stock market and housing prices and consumer confidence and the future of social security. And these things are so important to so many people in our culture because they've placed their hope and faith and trust in money in financial security, in our economy. And that is a fickle God to serve. If we serve money, then we've got quite a bit to worry about, especially as we're in another recession in America. But if you serve the living God, then ultimately you have nothing to worry about. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of that, that we serve a living God who cares for our needs. Jesus is always careful in his words, what he says. So in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things that he does is he keeps repeating this phrase, your heavenly father or your father in heaven. Jesus' favorite way of referring to God is father. So yes, he is almighty God, but he is also our loving father. Sixteen times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus refers to God as father. And when he teaches his disciples to pray, this model prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer, he begins by saying, I want you to call God our Father in heaven. Yes, he is all-powerful. Yes, he is all-knowing. But he is also a generous to a fault Father who richly cares for his own children, for us. And so understanding that and knowing God as our Father actually decreases our worry. I want to say it gets rid of it, but I don't think that's quite right because it's just part of what we struggle with, our emotions, our worry and anxieties and fears, but it decreases it the more that we understand that God is our Father. Worry is one indicator of our faith. Sometimes it's hard to sort of gauge, like, how is our faith life? If you ask somebody, hey, how's your faith life? Uh, you know, I'm not quite sure, but our level of anxiety and worry can tell us a lot about our faith life. Worry is a measure of my faith. It's an indicator of the God in whom I place my faith in. Small gods give us a lot to worry about, but Almighty God, who is also a caring Father, who is good, decreases my worry. My level of worry and my level of anxiety uh, reveals what I think about God's character and God's power. Jesus isn't just singing, you know, don't worry, be happy, as if life is carefree. Rather, he's saying, don't worry because God is rich in power and generous in character. And he knows about your concerns and he knows about the cares of your daily life and he's going to meet your needs and he's going to cover your back because he is our good father and he loves you. When we worry about things like food and clothing, about the physical concerns of everyday life, when we're really worried about that, we're living with a small view of God, a view of God that doesn't care about us. Part of what Jesus is teaching is that Father God cares about our physical life. That he cares about, yeah, he cares about our souls, but he also cares about our stomachs and our bodies and proper covering, our daily concerns. I think it's a little view of God that just thinks that God cares about our souls, like our eternal souls after we die and, and our souls right now, whom our immortal souls belong to here on earth. Obviously, God cares about that, but he also cares about our stomachs and our food. In the Lord's Prayer, when, when Jesus teaches us to pray, it's, part of it is, give us this day our daily bread. That's important for us. We need that. And it's okay to talk to our Father about the mundane needs of our daily life. And in fact, in praying, so it's sort of to balance that, 
Jesus warns us not to pray like the unbelieving pagans. So in Matthew 6, verse 7, he says, And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. A loving Father doesn't need His children begging for food in order for Him to give them the food that they need. Our Father knows, and He's good, and He's able to meet our needs. Jesus makes the comparison in the Sermon on the Mount between us as parents, good parents, and God as the perfect Father. And so he says in Matthew 7, 11, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And then Jesus tells the people to look around at the fields of wild flowers. And I imagine that even where Jesus was teaching on the mount, you just had to look around and you could see some of these flowers. And no one plants them. And yet they are more beautiful than the most magnificent palace. Flowers in fields growing like weeds planted by, God's, by God, dressed in, in splendid beauty. How much more is that God going to make sure that you are properly dressed? One of the things that we learn from Jesus' example here is that God created beauty and God celebrates beauty. Now, I feel like I shouldn't have to tell you that because it should be obvious just looking around at the world. But this Matthew 6 passage can be twisted and has been twisted by Christians to, to sort of promote a life that's been scrubbed of all beauty and all art. I shouldn't wear nice clothes because Jesus tells me not to worry about what I wear. I should eat bland food and not enjoy gourmet food because life is more than food and clothing. And some Christians have mistakenly even worked hard to make life intentionally bland so that they appear more godly and more spiritual. And so they give up the, the rich, colorful, tasty life that I think Jesus here is endorsing. Look at the flowers. I mean, look at the birds. You ever think about just, I mean, God, this magnificent artist making birds of such rich diversity and variety. He could have just made three species of birds and five different kinds of flowers, but there are thousands and thousands of birds. There are so many unique different flowers on the face of the earth. God is creative and his work is beautiful. And so as people who follow Jesus, it's okay to pursue art and beauty and rich flavors and enjoy the wonders of the creation that God has given to us. Our Father has blessed us with this life, but Jesus here is also warning us that life is more than physical, that we need to be concerned about seeking true treasure. Now when I think about seeking treasure, I think about pirates, and then I think about how they just relentlessly pursue this treasure. And the question here is, what are you relentlessly pursuing with your life? What treasure is dictating the course of your life? Is it food? Is it drink? Is it clothing? Or are you chasing after God and his kingdom? This passage really isn't about food. It's not about clothing. It's about the focus of our life. It's about what are we seeking in our life. It's about priorities. This is a call away from a self-centered life, my own food, my own clothing, my own wants and needs, to a Christ-centered life, considering God's will. What does Christ want me to do? It's a call to make Jesus Lord of life, even the mundane food and clothes that we all need. And the command is to seek God's kingdom and righteousness and all of these other things. As important as they might be, but not as important as the kingdom of God, all of those other things are just going to take care of themselves. And actually, that's not quite right. They're not going to take care of themselves. Father God is going to take care of them on our behalf. He knows what we need, and he's rich and generous in character, and he's going to meet those needs. This is a call to, uh, by Jesus to make God and his kingdom our number one priority the number one thing in our lives. Jesus is stating quite clearly that following him isn't something we just do Sunday morning, something that we do in our free time, something that's just a hobby, but rather it's something that affects all of our life, our food, our clothing, and everything else that's more important than that. It's our, our inner soul, it's our inner food life, it's our outer clothing life, it's all of that dedicated to Jesus and his kingdom. 
Part of following Jesus is seeking his kingdom and then allowing God to take care of and worry about our daily needs. Not running after these things at the expense of doing God's will and working to establish his kingdom instead. It's a call as we begin this new year to seek, seek the kingdom of God. <clears throat> the kingdom of God, I would define as wherever Jesus reigns as king. It's the big picture of what God is doing in the world. And I guess I want to say in the universe. It's bigger than any church. It's bigger than any mission or nation or Christian leader. It, it encompasses everything that God is up to in redeeming his fallen creation everywhere throughout time. So underground churches in China, cathedrals filled with worshipers in Europe, Christians worshiping in fields in Africa, a food bank in an inner city neighborhood. It's God's reign in this world, things that are done for his glory, for his name's sake. That's the kingdom of God. And so a local church like yours and like mine, we're part of that kingdom, a small part. But I love to think about the fact that we as outposts of the kingdom of God are part of something far bigger than what we could imagine. I mean, in time and space, like geographically, God is at work in this whole world and God has been at work and will continue to be at work before we were born and after we are gone. Now, if this is what we're to seek in 2021, the kingdom of God, then I guess I have a couple questions and one is, I mean, I already kind of answered the one a little bit of, you know, what is the kingdom of God? It's where Jesus reigns as king. But, but how do we find it? Right? If we're to seek it, then we probably should think about how do we find it? It is where Jesus is king, where Jesus reigns, where he is Lord. And when you accept Jesus as your king, you are part of the kingdom of God wherever it is that you are. The Bible talks about us changing our citizenship. When you accept Jesus as your Lord, as your king, as ruler of your life, you are no longer um, a citizen of your country primarily. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God primarily. Citizen of your country secondarily. So if you're a Christian, then your allegiance is first and foremost to Christ. That got Christians in the first century in a lot of trouble with the Roman Empire because they expected your uh, main allegiance to go to Caesar. Caesar is Lord, and Christians were saying, no, actually, Jesus is Lord. That's part of the seeking first. So we don't belong to a political party. We don't belong to a particular agenda, political agenda, or even a nation first and foremost. We belong to our Lord, Jesus, our Master, our Lord, the one that we serve, the one that we follow. He sets our priorities. The kingdom of God and how it materializes in our lives is what he is all about. And it's something that happens now, and it's something that continues to happen later. It's a present reality when we accept Jesus as our Lord and follow him, but it's also this future promise that unfolds in our lives. So... Yeah, I mean, that's how you find it. Maybe these questions should be asked in the other order. Um, but my other question is then, how do you seek it? Because I, I hear Jesus here saying, seek the kingdom of God. And it's not a one and done. It's something that you do with the rest of your life. It's a lifelong pursuit. It's his rule and his reign and his righteousness, not ours, not, not our sense of right and wrong or our culture's sense of right and wrong or opinion polls. But it's trying to follow Jesus, his will, his agenda, his, his uh, kingdom. I have to tell you, when I first read this passage and thought about preaching it today, especially that stuff about worry, you know, just to stand up here and say, do not worry. Um, I, I was a little troubled with that. And so was one of my favorite commentators who writes about this passage in his book, The Christ Book. This is from Frederick Dale Bruner. And here's what he writes. At first glance, this command not to be anxious about food or clothes offends us. As a missionary in the Philippines, I was convinced that this is a text that cannot be preached to the poor. It's cruel to tell the poor not to be anxious about getting enough to eat or wear. But we must ask what the text actually says. It does not tell disciples to be unconcerned about whether others have enough to eat or wear. Jesus' whole ministry teaches the opposite is the case. Instead, we are commanded to take our eyes off ourselves, off our lives, off our own selfish 
anxiety with our desires for good things for ourselves and to look around God's world for a place where we can throw ourselves into the cause of God's righteousness. I love that last phrase. We can throw ourselves into the cause of God's righteousness. That's a pretty good call for 2021. Seeking God's kingdom is being concerned for food for others. Jesus will say later, for the least of these, and clothing for the naked. And again, Jesus will say, for the least of these, what you do to them, you do for me. So no wonder so many churches have food banks and food drives and clothing ministries. Jesus isn't denouncing food or clothing, but he's challenging us in this passage to focus our attention away from our own needs to trust the Father for them, and instead to focus on the needs of others. And a big part of the seeking is also um, chasing after Jesus, seeking God, pursuing a love relationship with the Creator the way that a young man pursues a date with the girl of his dreams. It's an obsession. It's something you think about all the time. It's surrendering your heart and your mind and your life to the will of that person, to the will of Christ. Making room in your life for Him. Pursuing Jesus as your number one priority and the love of your life. That too is the challenge for 2021. That seeking transforms your life. It transforms your livelihood. It's um, seeking God's kingdom, saying, how can I proclaim the Lordship of Christ in every part of my life, every day of my life? It's asking, what would Jesus do with my life? What is He doing in my life? and through my life. If he's the definition of a righteous life, then how can I be like him in the way that I live my life, in the way that I do my job, in the way that I treat other people? How can I honor God every day of my life? That's part of that ongoing seeking of the kingdom of God. 2020 was a weird year, right? I mean, it was challenging in ways that we did not anticipate a year ago. My guess is 2021 will be too. Here's the challenge, is to test God in this. We live in an age of anxiety. We live in a culture of worry. We live in a country that's defined by self-centered consumerism. And we, because we're part of this culture, we too are tempted to worry and to be anxious about life. Here's what one of the followers of Jesus wrote. From a prison cell to the church, that was struggling with worry and anxiety. In Philippians 4 verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. And if you're worrying about something, and most of us probably are a bit concerned about things, Try that. Just test God in this. Just pray about it. It might seem actually kind of dumb, and you don't have to tell anybody else. You don't have to pray out loud, but just give it to God. Sometimes we just need to be reminded that we have a Father who loves us, who is able to do more than we could ask or imagine, and His power is at work in our lives. And sometimes all we need to do is ask. Following Jesus is a life of peace. There may still be conflict and bills may still pile up and there might be a lot of struggles in life that seem bigger than we are, but peace is part of the kingdom of God. Peace is part of following Jesus, not worry and fear and anxiety. Now, I know that most of us are not slaves to fashion and most of us don't worry about where our next meal is coming from, but we do have a father who cares for us, who knows what we need even before we ask. The one who, who feeds the birds and adorns the flowers is going to take care of us. And that frees us then to take our eyes off our own needs so that we can throw ourselves into the cause of God's righteousness in 2021. Let's pray together. Lord, we confess that our faith often becomes lazy and selfish and that our prayers have more to do with us than with you, that they often focus more on our wants and our needs than on others. So we ask, Father, that you would free us from anxiety and from needless worry and endless fears, and that you would help us to focus our faith on you, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. 
May we trust in you to provide all that we need in 2021 from the abundance of your riches in glory. And may we turn our eyes away from our own wants and desires and instead pursue your desires and your agenda with a passion that fills us with joy. We dedicate ourselves, our present and our future to you, to the service of your kingdom, and we ask your blessing and your guidance in this upcoming year. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.